Welcome to the Rock Coding YouTube channel. My name is Anton and today we're going to take a look at what happens when you are an actual boss at meta programming. We've taken a look at functional programming and we've seen how good our solutions may look like when we're using it. We've then had a little bit of a sprinkle of meta programming and we've seen how it can give us scalability for free essentially. What happens when you're a 007 at meta programming, you know? Don't forget, if you're enjoying the video, leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section. Don't forget to check out the description. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're still working our same solution. Here we will we were building functions. Over here we had our sprinkle of meta programming. I've gone ahead, taken this solution, copied it into this project, and the focus for this project is going to be to eliminate most of this stuff into an actual function as if it was written manually. At the moment, we're substituting the bare minimum. What if we can generate whole modules of code using expression trees? And if somebody good at metaprogramming that has been watching the previous video might have taken a look at this lambda and said, what are you doing? Why, why is this over here? And I agree, this is not needed here, but if you are not proficient at metaprogramming and the expression API, you may not know how to remove this lambda from here. And what we're going to be doing in this video is trying to rewrite this as much as possible into expression trees and as much as it makes sense. So how much can we actually rewrite in expression trees? What can go, what cannot go? The main things that are going to determine what can and can't be rewritten are essentially variables. So the things that are on the outside will have to stay on the outside. So for example, if we go to the function over here, vectors that are coming from the query that is going to variate. And then if you have the value over here, the string that is also going to vary depending on what you're going to get from the query. So for the vector parameter and for the string parameter, these are going to remain on the outskirts of our expression API. What we really want to do is once we have this character, uh, let's go ahead, take it out here and I'll call it comp character. This is going to sit on the outskirts and then this right over here, this function is what's going to consume these parameters. So the comp character, the number and the vector. So ideally what we want to have is a function that has all of these three parameters. So first of all, we're going to try to clean it up. As I said before, we want to get rid of this property value because we've already dipped our toe into expressions and we've said we're going to have a vector parameter coming in. So this vec parameter can represent that. And then we have this property access. So on the incoming vector, we're accessing whatever property it is that we're accessing. First of all, let's create a function which is going to extract all of this logic so we forget about the for loop and all of that. The query parameter map is going to accept a function of string func and all of this stuff. We're going to call this function create parameter map. This is going to accept a property info. So we can just call this property info, take property access, pull it up into here, take this function, return it from here for now. The function over here, this is what we're going to be replacing with an expression that we're going to be building. Otherwise, this create map will place it over here and not parameter property info. We're going to be placing it here. And now the for loop looks really simple and we can actually focus on what's happening over here. So let's say that at first we're going to try to rebuild these equalities. So I'll cut them. I'll place them over here. And we're going to say that for whatever property we're going to be getting, so that's going to be property A, we're going to try to lift up an expression and we're going to compare this property access to some kind of constant. What is this constant? Well, it is going to be this number. So we actually need a parameter. Let's take this fact param and I'm actually going to put it, pull it into this function. I'm going to copy this parameter. And I'm going to say that there is a number parameter in here as well. Let's call it number. And we're going to be comparing it to this number. We're then going to duplicate this a couple of times, take less than place over here, greater than place this over here, get rid of the functions. And now we have the individual comparisons. Uh, let's put these into variables. So var uh, equals uh, less than and then greater than we can then further take these functions 
let's paste them over here. And instead of having these expressions greater than and etc, we can say we're going to use a lambda, there is an integer that's going to come in. And alongside with that integer, there is actually going to be a vector 3d that is coming in. And then we want to return a boolean. Uh, this is going to be a function. The property axis here doesn't really make sense. What should really be going in the first slot is the body, which is the individual comparisons. Uh, again, the property axis still doesn't make sense. It's going to be the vec parameter. And vec parameter and number parameter are in the same order as they are in here. So vec and int, it's just that the body is going first. All right, uh, let's replace this with lt and gt. We will say that all of these are functions. And I've actually forgot to place func right over here and not fucking super easy one to get wrong, but you know, we correct our mistakes. So these are the functions that we have. Perhaps what we want to do now is actually just compile them. So we create the functions straight away, we compile them, and now we can take pretty much the same switch case statement we have over here. Let's remove this, still have the lambda. I know some of you may be going, well, we're not actually creating this lambda body and we'll get there again this is just meant to be a gradual introduction we'll take the comparison chart we are going to stick it into there we're then going to take all of the functions that we have over here so just select them oh, not like that and jump to the next error select invoke them here vector is the first parameter number is the next parameter comp char can be the argument out of range so we're not handling that and there we have it so uh, semicolon over here pretty much the same solution although now we're not resolving the functions we are just calling to the functions and the functions have been pre-generated uh, let me take the properties over here just going to slap them on there and remove the properties parameter and here's the solution it is running so let's go ahead and check it out so if we say that x is more than 50 uh, might not tell us much let's say w is uh, or more uh, i forgot how to how this works so greater than and then less than 10. there we go w seems to be less than 10. Uh, let's check it out where z equals uh, 18. do we have many of those and forgot the e and there we have it so there's actually two occurrences that look like that so the solution still works uh, let's come back to the code and now we're gonna work towards actually replacing this function over here. Is it hard to replace it? Well, no, again, uh, let's take a look at the parameters that we have. We still have the vector, we have the number, just the additional parameter that we have over here is the character. So the final function that we should be creating, uh, let's call it final, should look something like this. We are gonna need another character parameter. Let's take this character parameter, slap it on the end here, and generally, when you're working with the expression API, uh, if you know uh, this notation where you're saying, yeah, I want a function which returns a Boolean, this is going to be my expression. So I just create a function which returns something. Uh, you can inspect this and see how this looks like. So for example, if I supply something like some kind of character, let's say L, I'm going to switch on this and uh, let's say an L occurrence is going to return true and I forgot the function over here uh, what you're gonna see is an error you cannot have a switch expression in an expression tree so how are we actually meant to represent this body if you know anything about C sharp and syntactic sugar stuff like this will generally get lowered down so let's take a look at low level C sharp and what do you know it is just a bunch of if statements and funnily enough they go if the character doesn't equal compare the next doesn't equal compare the next doesn't equal throw expression so it does all the negatives first so i mean we can copy it or we can do positives first if positive return otherwise fall back to the other statement but uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing that it's doing here all right uh, for the body, uh, let's say we're going to have an expression. There are if then and if then else. Uh, these do not return anything. This is just a conditional expression. There is then the condition expression, which is more of a ternary expression. So it's going to test some kind of condition right over here. We have the test and that hid the tooltip. So let me bring that up again. And let, let me actually open up the source code. 
what do we do? So we have the test condition. If true, this is going to execute. If not, that is going to execute. Okay, and we'll close this. We have our condition. And the first thing we want to check if the character that we are comparing and we've already made the character param for it. So we can get an expression if it's equal or if we're writing it the same way that it is written here, we're going to saying we're going to be saying that it's not equal. If the character parameter isn't equal to L and we cannot just write L, we will have to use constant expression, right? And that is how we capture this variable. Once we're comparing it to L, if it's not equal, we want to do the next comparison. In this case, we have to use expression condition again. We're going to open this up, copy this, place this over here. If the character is not equal to L, which is our next one, and this one actually should be E, then again, we want the condition, we will duplicate this brace on the bottom, we will duplicate this line over here, we're then going to compare it to G, format the code a little bit. So not equal to E, then next comparison, the next comparison at the G, it is going to end. So the thing that should actually happen over here is we should throw an exception. So the exception that we're throwing, again, if you want to capture something, you are going to have to do it in a constant. So a new constant is an argument out of range exception. We can give it some kind of cute error message like bad character uh, parameter, uh, place a comma. And then if this is actually correct, we want to do the comparison. For G, if we're actually equal to G, uh, we're not going to have these functions because then the actual comparison is going to happen and we just want to return the result. If it is actually equal to L, and this is a little bit confusing and we are doing it backwards, and yeah, otherwise this is going to be EQ as in equals. So if it's not equals, we're going to continue. If it is actually, then we're going to trigger this comparison. So uh, this is going to return some kind of result, which is going to be a Boolean result. And that's actually what we want to return from our function. So let's go ahead and give this some space. We're going to take this whole condition, place it instead of GT, just like that. Maybe give it a little bit of space here. And our final Lambda, which is going to be compiled, Let's go ahead, place it over here. First thing goes the vector. The next thing is going to be the integer. So the number and then the comparison character. We can actually just take these uh, and slap them over here. And actually, as I'm writing it, basically, there is something here that I'm going to make a video on later, but you don't actually want to be doing that. Right. So let's actually stop and just pass uh, the primitives like they are. All right. So here's a setup. Uh, we've managed to construct the final function like this. Uh, we have all of the parameters that are going in. We have the property access. We have the individual comparisons. And then we have the final condition of uh, trying to actually execute these comparisons. So uh, with that, the application should be restarted. It looks like argument types do not match. And I think it is going to be in this last one because uh, one branch is going to be not not be a boolean because we're throwing an expression and the other one is actually returning a boolean. So for throw, you can specify uh, the type of the expression. Uh, this is going to look weird, but essentially we're saying we want our exception to return type of boolean. All right, uh, we're going to save that and maybe let me restart the application. And there we have it. I'm going to close this window. I'm going to refresh it and it looks like everything is still working. So Z equals 18 W is five and three. So let's lower W down to five. So we just have one result and looks like that is working. If we lift it up to 15 and nothing is there, let's do 50 and we have even more results. So now we have all of these solutions together. I'm going to drop down the terminal and yeah, this is the final thing. This is what you're capable of building if you know metaprogramming. And if you watched up to here and you're sitting in your like, man, why would I ever build this shit? Uh, let me cut the video here. We're going to go to the benchmarks and we're going to see. Okay. And we have the results. I'll make the code just slightly bigger uh, to highlight some of the changes that I made. So the graph is still the same. I have created three new classes. All of these classes do is create the query predicates type. 
It is no longer an alias. I've moved it to the shared project, which basically just an alias, but you know, an old school alias. Uh, we still have the graph, so all, all of the types are now shared. The W is just not going to be consumed by the functional project. Otherwise, all of these query predicates, uh, fn, uh, sprinkle, and 007, all they focus on is creating uh, this dictionary of mapping some kind of string to a function. If we take a look at sprinkle of metaprogramming, same thing is happening. We're creating the predicate over here. So in query create sprinkle, uh, the property gets too lowered, the function gets assigned, the result gets returned. Same in metaprogramming, so I moved it into a separate class. Again, the factory just creates the thing. We fill up the dictionary right over here and we return it. So the process for setting up this query predicates type exists in these classes. This is what you see me calling here to pre-create these individual query predicates. We This is the query we're then running. So I'm excluding W from here as it's not something that's going to exist on the FN. And I'm trying to make sure that the predicate that we create is going to run as many times as possible. So I'm just saying less than 99, less than 50, greater than one. So we match as many elements as possible. So we then have uh, the graph, uh, the query, uh, and the logic for these is going to look exactly the same. So we just have the graph, we build up the query, and then we trigger the query. So we actually want to trigger the execution of the predicate that we have over here. This means that the functional approach is actually going to use this as well. So once we actually have all of these loaded up into the same container, that the functional solution can actually look like the metaprogramming solutions as well. All right, but this is the condition we have here. We use predicates func, uh, so, so it's just the predicates collection which is going to differ between these cases. We have the results and they look like this. Uh, let's put them over here and let's talk about them. So the functional approach, uh, we have uh, 35, the sprinkle 21, and then 007, we have the fastest one, and the least memory allocating one. Now, do remember that the memory allocation here, although very little between each of these, uh, there maybe has to do something with the list, uh, with the way that we're extracting a string. So there is an odd thing here and there. So in the end, the full metaprogramming approach has actually turned out to be the best one. Although probably hard to maintain, but you know, you want to be a good programmer and you actually want to be able to write code like this if the opportunity arises. If you know metaprogramming, not only can you write code that scales out to possibilities that you perhaps haven't even foreseen, but chances are it is also going to be faster. Since you're not actually creating these individual components and then piecing them together in another component, you're just building the rules for generating that final melded component as one piece. And this will be it for this video. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. Please let me know what is your approach? Do you still think objects, functional programming, perhaps metaprogramming? I know it's uh, the right tool for the situation, but which one is your favorite? Mine, personally, metaprogramming. If you would like the source code for this video as well as my other videos, please come support me on Patreon. I will really appreciate it and a big and special thank you goes out to all of my current Patreon supporters. You help me make these videos. If you would like to know C Sharp as I do, I highly recommend you check out my course. Link for it as well as my merch shop is in the description. As always, thank you for watching and have a good day.